Okay, so are we going to do that one if that I was suggested to. or did you There was talk something, something else you else? wanted to talk about, and I'm trying to remember what it was. Can I briefly talk about something and maybe while you think about what it was that you wanted to talk about? What's this one called? That gets my goat. Really? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Steve Audio Fiction no! Magazines. They're that not going to laugh at you. That gets my goat. Okay. <clears throat> Does it get your goat when somebody talks over you? A little bit, but not a whole lot, because I'm not the one that edits it. Oh, <laughs> <you> <laughs> I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Good night, everybody. And we're here to annoy you oh. with trivialities. Are we really? Now, I, I'm sort of talking to you, Big, but I'm also sort of talking to the mm-hmm. listening audience. You're also sort of talking down to me? I am, because <laughs> you're kind of a piece of crap. You know this, but sometimes you need to be reminded, you piece of crap. <laughs> but in, in case you're just joining us, I have an uncle who's very close to me in age. He's only eight years older than I am, and he married a child. You remember this? Child bride. Yeah, I think I've heard of that. Anyhow, he, he moved into this house. So you, you know what I'm talking Ghost about? Ghost house. Okay. Murder house. Yes, murder house. Yes. And so, so the backstory of this is... Uh, he uh, didn't have a lot of money, and they were looking for a house, and he found a really excellent deal on a house that was... The sellers were desperate because there had been a double murder-suicide in the house. A young man had awake, awoken... Awoken or awakened? I'm not sure what the past participle of awakened... He woke up in the middle of the yes. night with a raging erection. I'm sorry, whoa, whoa, that was me. He woke up in the middle of the night, killed his brother, or maybe he went out uh, over and killed his mother, and then killed his brother, and then went down into the basement and he killed himself. Is that how you remember me telling it before? That works for me. I, I think that that's how it was. Maybe there was no brother. Maybe he blamed it on his brother before he killed himself. Maybe the brother escaped and is still living in the, the crawl space of the house. Anyway, when my uncle John heard about this, he was just like, oh, wow. Ah, I really like the house, and I really like the price, but I'm just afraid that if my new bride heard about this, she would not want to live there. So, after much consideration, I've decided not to tell my wife. Yes, we will take the house. <laughs> okay, so you knew all this already. Yes. Yes. I've mentioned it before on the show, but I don't think it would mean anything to tell the story I'm about to tell unless you already knew about them. It's like it's the sequel and you have to do that quick paragraph to catch everybody up on the last one just in case there's right. somebody. Previously on Buffy the Vampire. Yeah, that didn't story. listen to that uh, episode. The thing with my uncle is he's he's sort of a skeptic and sort of a believer. He claims that, you know, he's seen my grandmother's ghost before who's come and counseled him, but not in a scary way. It's just like, oh, she came from the other side to wish me well or to... Give me some stock tips. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, he's got all sorts of... Oh, yeah, I guess he's got to be a believer because of the stuff I've told you about his his daughter being able to speak in tongues and see the future and somehow the, her synapses align and suddenly she's she knows... Things that she couldn't possibly know. Anyway, she's never, ever gone to the bathroom. That's right. Never. (laughs) He and uh, and his previous wife never even had sex once. I wonder if that's a pre-joke or a callback. I think that's a callback at this point. Because we've got a lot of episodes just in the can, if you will. Speaking of in the can, that are just ready to go and... When we get to this one, we will get to it. Okay. Anyhow, I've told you these things before. And uh, it's a holiday coming up. And a bunch of relatives from Las Vegas are coming to stay and visit my mom, visit my uncle. You know, Bring that kind of dead thing. mice to put in your bed. Uh, very probably. That's, you know, turnabout. <laughs> that's fair play. <laughs> and uh, none of them will stay at John's house. And this was all discussed yesterday during Sunday dinner. And John said, yeah, I I, I don't know why they would do that. It's too bad. But, you know, screw them. 
And I was just like, what a weird thing to say. I, I, that's strange that he would say that, but we sort of moved on to the next subject. And then his wife got up to like feed the baby or, or check. And as soon as she was out of the room, he says, okay, here's the thing. The last time my brother was here visiting, staying at our house, his 10 year old daughter said that she saw somebody down in the basement. She told her parents this, and now it's gotten around and none of them want to stay <laughs> at the house. And I was just like, what? when you say the basement, you mean... And he says, yeah, that's what I mean. And there was a moment of silence around the table <laughs> where everybody sort of digested this. And then all of a sudden we thought of the girl who said these things and, you know, what a spoiled little prima donna she is and attention whore and all this stuff. And, and it's like, okay, you know, what's more likely? So before his wife came back in the room, it's like, well, what exactly? My mom said, what exactly did she see? And, 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 and he said exactly word for word what his brother, my uncle, had told him. And it could have been a shadow. It could have been, you know, because my uncle had gotten up to go to the bathroom or to get a drink of water or whatever. And while he was out of the room... His daughter claimed to have seen this person, and it could easily have been him because he was up getting a drink of water. And so we were all like, oh, oh, okay, well. That's it was actually bad. Stannis sneaking in to Remley's tent. Sorry, I've got that on my mind right now. I don't know what yeah, to do. Yeah, you do. You, <laughs> you're gaming and throning a lot, man. So... I was just like, oh, gosh, I got to talk to you about this. Holy cow. Do you think? And then his wife walked back in. And suddenly we were talking about, wow, you know, I can't believe it got so cold. Did you guys hear the wind last night? Like, yeah, it blew over our garbage cans. And you know, I had to clean that up, stuff up this morning. Oh, that sucked. And, you know, when you're not allowed to talk to, about something, suddenly you're just like, oh, gosh, I got it. I got it. And so finally, you know, later on, I got a chance to talk to him about it. And he's got a newborn baby. And he says that whenever the baby cries and his wife is unwilling to sit up with him, he will take the baby into this room where in the basement where the guy killed himself. And he's like, that's where I take the baby. That's like my alone time room. I, I, I like to go in there and it's a, it's a calm, peaceful place. There's, I don't get any bad feelings. There's nothing going on there. There's nothing in the house. You know, it's like, believe me, I w we would have moved a long time ago if there was ever any indication of anything kind of thing. And so I was just like, oh, well, okay, you know, that, that takes some of the, the sting off of it. But then my mom said, so how close to that room was where Jasmine saw this person? And he said, right outside that room. And so suddenly it sort of took the stink back onto it where we're all just like, oh, geez. And, you know, of course, when, when pressed, the, the girl couldn't describe who the person was, whether he was tall or, or short or white or, uh, you know, did, did, was he missing part of his head by any chance? Did he have a pumpkin instead of a head? <laughs> but that was interesting. And by this point, um, his wife had gone to change the baby or whatever, and she was gone for a long time. And so we all started talking about this again. And my sister started talking about these experiences she had where she, I guess she would have these night terrors when she was pregnant with my nephew, the, her first kid. Oh, yeah, Damien? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. She would have these night terrors, and her husband couldn't wake her up. And she would be in some state in between sleeping and waking, and he would shake her and all this stuff, and she would, sh you know, shriek and freak out. And, and he would, you know, he finally, after he sh shook her enough, she'd be like, oh, okay, it's gone. It's It's nothing. But And the next morning, no memory at all that this had ever happened. And she said, yeah. and I said, well, if you have no memory, how do you know that these things happen? And he's like, well, he won't let me forget it. He brings <laughs> it up all the time. Um, but somehow... I do that to my wife, too. She does all sorts of strange things at night. Or annoying things, or whatever they may be. And I make sure to not let her forget them, even though she has already. <laughs> It must be a husband thing to do. I guess so. But it's, the thing is, my sister says she remembers what she was dreaming and she remembers, you know, what she saw and all that. But I don't understand 
if she had no memory the next morning of having this episode, if she, how she can remember what she dreamt and, and what she saw, you know what I mean? The, the mm-hmm. story doesn't make sense. Right. That she can remember what she saw, but she doesn't remember having this episode. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know how the subconscious works. I don't know how dreams work or whatever you would call a night terror if it is more than a dream. And, and so, of course, and, and you've heard me say this before, but I have awakened, and it probably happens once a year, maybe twice a year. I will awaken from a nightmare and open my eyes and there'll be somebody standing at the foot of my bed. Old lady. And I'll go, <gasps> and in the second or whatever that I'm gasping or, or and not able to scream, that person is no longer there. And I, and I explain it is that my, my subconscious is taking a step back and letting my conscious come to the fore. And if there's just a moment of transition where I'm still partially dreaming, I'm still, you know, imagining, or I'm still remembering the dream. I'm not completely awake. See, I don't believe that there was actually somebody standing at the foot of my bed. And then my nephew, who is six years old, said, sometimes that happens to me. I wake up and there'll be somebody standing beside my bed and they're like this. And he made this face. (laughs) Oh my gosh, dude. Suddenly, like all of this fun talk about, oh, my sister did this and oh, okay, and the stupid cousin who's spoiled. Of course, she's going to make up stories. Fled. And seeing my little nephew impersonate the face of the person that was standing beside his bed really upset me. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my gosh. And I grabbed him and I'm like, that's not real, right? You, you understand that there's nobody there. And I, I became like super protective, super parental about this. You know, it's just like you have convinced me that there is something evil in this house. But now I'm going to lie and pretend that there's no such thing as ghosts. All right, my boy, come here. The funny thing is. It's you standing beside his bed every time. Oh, really? Making this face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because, like, you were talking about your sister and her night terrors and stuff and how she doesn't remember that she even had one. But then when she's told that she has one, somehow she remembers now what it was about. Is that how your wife is? No, no, she... she... It's all gone. We might as well just make this whole episode about this. Have we ever talked about your wife's? We have to have. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's been brought up several times. Like, for example, just the other day, I mean, my wife has to go to bed really early because she has a really early start time at her work. And, uh, yeah, the other day I had the baby and he was just being a monster and I was so sick and tired. He probably could have stayed up later, but he was just being a butt. And I'd had enough, and so I took him up, and he didn't want to go to bed, so of course he started screaming. And any time my wife hears him screaming, despite the fact that she needs to be asleep, she only gets like five hours or less of sleep a freaking day, she still is up, and here, here, let me take him. Here, I'll take him. I just, I just want to snuggle with him. It's okay. I'll take him. And I'm like, you can't take him. He's not going to go to sleep. He's going to keep you awake for an hour at least. No, get out of here and go to bed. Well, but, And then the next interrupt. morning. Is it because you've mentioned this sort of phenomenon before and you said she sort of has a martyr complex. But is that what she's doing or is it this is the last kid I'm going to have? I know this is hard, but I want to spend this time with him. Why? Because she's like, OK, I, I will sacrifice. I, I think it's a, it's a little of several different things it's you know a mother's kind of instinct when she hears the kid cry that she needs to help the kid and take care of him even though i mean because he cries like five times a night or whatever so we'll have to get up with him so she's probably used to getting up and going out and dealing with him even when she doesn't need to you know there's all of us still awake we all can take care of him we don't need her to get up in her small amount of time that she has to sleep to take care of him but yeah, she did that just the other day. That was Friday, I think. Today's Monday. She gets up on Friday to do that. And I'm just like, go back to sleep. You don't need to be doing this. You have to work tomorrow starting at like friggin' 1 a.m. or whatever. Go to sleep. And sh- the worst part is she's stubborn about it <laughs> when this happens. She won't just take go to sleep as an answer. 
She's, oh, no, no, it's okay, I'll take him. It's, no, I, uh, I just want to snuggle with him. It's like, get out of here. You're only making it worse because now he's crying for you. But yeah, the next morning I tell her about it. She doesn't remember ever having done that. She doesn't remember getting up? No, she doesn't remember having gotten up, having fought with me, having said all this stuff. Wow, because there's no chance she's still asleep. No, yeah, it's not. Because she's up and out of the room and talking. Right. But does she say, we never talk or whatever while she's doing <laughs> Where you're like, does, oh, okay, she's actually sleeping. She doesn't do that in, in those cases. But yeah, she, she will still do that stuff too. Yeah, I, I wrote a story that still is unpublished because I can't come up with cover art for it called Sleep Talking Gal. And hopefully by the time this episode airs, that's available for you not to buy over at Amazon.com. But yeah, the, the stories you used to tell about the things that she would say were fascinating to me. I don't know why it is. Well, just, I mean, there are various reasons, obviously. But just the thought that your wife could say stuff to you so it's between you and her, but it's really just between you. <laughs> she ha she will have no memory of this conversation. That is such a fascinating idea where, you know, you could say something to her knowing she will never, ever, you know, it's like I killed a guy when I was 17. I've never told anybody this. And I told you about it six other times. And since you always forget, I'm going to tell you again. Because, you know, it makes me feel good to tell it because I really, really liked it. And it's only a matter of time before I'm going to do it again. Th these kind of <laughs> ideas are just really interesting to me the, the, that you are having a conversation with somebody, but it's really one-sided. Although it's not because she participates in the conversation. It's not like she just nods off, right? Yeah, yeah. She'll talk back to me. She'll answer and stuff like that. And that's the weird... I wonder if it's stored up there somewhere, you know? Like, I'll say stuff to her and then she'll remember it. Though she won't remember the conversation that it was in, you know what I mean? I wonder sometimes, like, just how gone it is. You know what I mean? Like, if I was to say, <laughs> hey, I killed a man last night or something like that. And then the next morning she'd be like... Why am I thinking that he said something, you know, or you, just like she won't remember the conversation, but they're in her head somewhere planted in there. He said he killed a man. Is that real? Or did I dream it? Or you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes I've wondered just like, how gone you never stuff played is. games with her before. It was like my favorite color is purple. My favorite color is purple. My favorite color is purple. And you say it for 10 minutes. And then the next morning you're like, hey, honey, what's my favorite color? Just just to see if she retains anything. <laughs> I've never like, tried that. Maybe I should. But yeah, I was just thinking about that with your sister. I wonder, because, you know, there there are things that, like, there are experiments that people have done with, like, memory and stuff like that. My favorite YouTube series, Vsauce, which if you don't watch those, you ought to watch them because they're super cool, just interesting things freaking crap that they tell you about so anyways the, they were talking about memories and how people will supply memories for things that don't that like didn't exist for example the experiment that they did they took a bunch of pictures of some person from when they were children but mixed in with these pictures from when they were children were fake pictures that weren't from anything they like photoshopped them up or something like that and then they would go through these pictures with these people oh tell 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 me about this picture what's going on here and they'll go through them and they'll get to the fake ones and the people will make up a memory to go with the picture because they're asked for it and they'll suddenly oh yeah that was uh oh i think that was when we went camping at the beach and oh yeah i remember you know, they'll, they'll supply things. So I wonder sometimes, or sometimes, I wonder when you're talking about your sister who couldn't remember even having had this episode, if after she's told, hey, you did this and you were dreaming and you were screaming this, all of a sudden she's like, oh, I was screaming this because, and then supplies the she dream. She fills in the details. I wonder if it has something to do with that or, or what the deal is. Yeah, there's so many crazy things that go on in our minds. I mean, our minds can do wacky stuff and amazing stuff. 
and so little of it do we even understand yet. I wonder how much that explains various things. <laughs> you know, how much does that explain ghosts? And how much does that explain various phenomenons that have existed throughout the years? Just weird things that our minds are doing. Well, yeah, the, you know, one of the big through lines of the believers in alien abduction is that they all look the same. They all, they, they all, people always describe the shape of the gray's eyes and the face and, and all that stuff. And they're like, well, if these weren't real, then how could all these people from disparate backgrounds, you know, of different ages and all that describe the same dang thing or, or people that talk about life after death explaining the whole bright light and your family members waiting for you and all that, you know, when someone has had a, a near death experience or a, uh, what did they call it when you actually flatline and come Yeah, it's like you died and were brought back or whatever. Uh, and they say, well, you know, how could all of these experiences be so dang similar if they're not real? And we understand so little of our own brains because they're unfathomable. They're they're so they're like a computer the size of a city. You know what I mean? And and you couldn't explore all of this computer and and and, and you know all the processes and all the things. It, it, I don't know. I on on you you mentioned YouTube. I watched a couple of those little shows that Darren Brown did, and he's a he's a I, I don't know if you call him a hypnotist or a Shyster? mentalist. Oh. If you want to, let's say he's a mentalist. He's a, he's an Englishman and he's really, really famous over there. And over here, we don't really know him, but he's really good at making people believe what he wants them to believe. And, and there've been times, you know, because that he'll do like a little documentary and he'll, he'll convince somebody of something totally. And then he'll show us how he did it, you know, how he could get a certain response, how he could set up by the way that he says things or the, his body language or whatever that makes it seem like he can read somebody's mind or he can project thoughts into somebody's head. And what it is, is he's a master at these tiny little subtle hints and clues and, and pushes to make somebody go and do what he wants them to do. You know, in the same ways that there would be the uh, the spiritualists, the readers of, of you know, who would talk to your dead father or your, 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 your dead wife or whatever in a, a reading, if you call it in a seance and something like that. And even if they had never met you, they would ask these vague questions of, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some, the name starts with an, an S. Is it an S or it could be an F. And you're like, well, is it Francie? Fra France, Francie. And, and she was somebody very important to you. I'm, I'm sensing a, a family member, a close family. Yes, yes, she was my wife. And, you know, that, that kind of stuff. These guys were able to give you clues to steer you in the direction that they wanted you to go. And because we want to believe, we forget all of the times, the things that she said wrong. He's like, yes, she had... She had dark hair, didn't she? No, she was blonde. Right, blonde. She was blonde and she was very, was short. Was she short? No, she was as tall as me. Yes, exactly. She was a, a tall blonde woman or what? You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And because you fixate on the three or four things that she happens to guess right. Because, you know, okay, she's either fat or she's thin. And so she chooses thin. And you're like, yes, yes. I always told her she needed to eat more kind of thing. You're like, wow, oh my gosh. And she's like, yes, yes. I, she, she mentioned that, that it's, she misses that, that you ask her to eat more now that it's been so long. It's now like so long. It's only anymore. been three weeks. Oh, for her, it's been much longer. You know, all that stuff. <laughs> we pick up on that because we want to believe that it's real or because, you know, I, we don't realize that we're being led by the hand. Anyway, this Darren Brown stuff is fascinating to me. It's just like how it, even though we're being shown that it's fake, and not fake, but you know what I mean, that, that he has a system of doing it, it still feels like magic. It still feels like a trick. It still feels like, no, there's no way he could have known that or gone there or made that guy, you know, there was one thing where they were in two different rooms and he was talking to a guy in the room, pretending that he had projected his spirit into the room with him. And he could tell where the guy was in the room and what he was touching and, and what he was doing because he was giving all these hints verbally that were making this guy go into a certain part of the room and do something with his hand and all that. 
I didn't pick up on it until afterward they said, you know, how many times did I use the word cross? And then they count them like, he said cross six times. It's like, so of course the guy crossed his legs. And it's like, oh, wow, how, but why, why would you do that? And I don't know. It's interesting because it's, it's the unknown. You know, I, maybe some people are terrified of the unknown, but I just like, I'm drawn by how, how can somebody do that? Why? What, what does that mean? Kind of thing. And so that story that I wrote came from you talking about your wife saying things. And, and lots of the time it was nonsense. But every once in a while you would sit up and pay attention because it was, it was something that was important. It was something that was, you know, about the kid or something that she hadn't told you or whatever. And of course she was going to tell you three days later when she was awake time when she told me she'd killed a man when she was 17 and she liked it and she it would be yeah. only a matter of time before she did it again yeah that was one of the more important ones not the most important <laughs> interestingly enough but i thought about that and i thought about what if she said something that she couldn't know and what if she did it again and what if you started to just anticipate and and you know it was like listen to her every night because she's saying things that she couldn't that, that, that are coming from some other place and that's what that story became and, and you know how it is i mean you don't know where you're going to get inspiration for a story but oh it is so much fun where you can say to somebody you inspired this when you said this to me you know what i mean yeah that that stuff is it's fun this is also part of the unknown is where do stories come from where do ideas and how do they mutate because they almost seem like living things like they control you rather than you controlling them yeah, sometimes that is kind of the way it is. That's that's an interesting thing, uh, how that works. We were just talking a little bit about that, about writers who sometimes write by the seat of their pants. They don't really have a uh, outline or a plan necessarily. They just kind of have the seed and then they just let it grow and don't bother to prune it or whatever you want to call it to shape it. They just ride it like a horse. Sometimes that's cool and it works. Other times you can tell when you get to the end of the book, you're just like, wow, this guy didn't know where he was going and kind of went nowhere. And that's too bad because it was a good idea to start with. Have you ever written a story like that? Where it was like you were, um, gosh, what did they call that? Where people would write and the, the, they would let the spirits control what they'd write. Do you know what I'm talking about? It, it, it's not free writing, but it was something like that, you know. The, the medium would just write and let their hand be controlled by the, you know, the, the forces spirits. of the supernatural. Do you ever have that where it's just like a story just is coming to you and you're just like, it, it's all you can do to write it down before it's gone. It's just coming and coming. It's like, I'm not making up this story. I'm receiving this story. I don't know if I've ever had something like that. Probably not. I'm much more methodical. I think when it comes to writing stories, I'm afraid to start into a story like, for example, and maybe by the time this comes out, we'll actually have done this, but... <laughs> we were supposed to do it today, right? Yeah, today was supposed to be the first day of doing this, and of course we didn't, but uh, we, me and Rich have been talking about doing a public story writing, I guess you might want to call it. Basically... It goes back to the thing where I was doing this on my blog where I was trying to lose weight and I was having a hard time uh, keeping myself from cheating. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put everything that I eat out on my blog and that way I'll be too ashamed of the fact that I ate, you know, a whole entire box of Oreos or something like that. So because I would be too ashamed to do that, I won't do it and it'll keep me from doing the bad stuff. And so I did this for a, a month. Wow. And I remember early on, Rich was uh, commenting on this. And he said, you know, it would be cool if there's some way we could do something like this with writing, too. And so I... Well, let me interrupt. You were really attentive to this. You you took pictures and described everything that you ate. I mean, it was you took it seriously. And that made me sit up and pay attention because it's like, wow, why can't you be like that about writing? <laughs> yeah, it's a good like you said you were going to do something, and then you did it. You did it to the point where I was just like, please, dude, we're eating right now. Don't take a picture of the food. Don't. don't, don't oh, my zipper was down. 
My middle finger was out. Oh. It was. <laughs> But yeah, so I did this for a month, and then one of your comments was, yeah, I wish you could do something like this with writing. And I thought, why can't we? Why don't we just do that? Why don't you and I do a thing where we have to write every day? And to prove that we wrote every day, we just type up what we've written, if we write it in a notebook like you do, or just copy and paste it if we write it in a computer, and just post it. Each day, everything that we wrote that day is posted. And we just work our way from the beginning to the end of the story in, in, in installments, a in a public forum. Everybody sees. If we don't post something, people know we didn't write. And they'll be like, hey, where's the rest of my story? Come on, man. Don't leave me hanging. And um, there's something so attractive about that of having people care where the story goes and where is the rest of the story and all that. That's got to feel really good when you're Dickens and there's people in America waiting for the next installment, you know, it's like just waiting for the boat to get there. We've been meaning to do this for a long time, pretty much since like day five or six of when uh, I started posting those things, which I've been done with doing that for like three weeks already. So it's almost been like two months since I started it. Uh, that's when I first got the idea, and I talked to you about it, and we've been meaning to do this for a long time, and just the other day, you're like, hey, when are we going to do that? And I said, okay, we'll start Monday. Just give me a couple days to get my story in order so I'm ready to start writing it. And yeah, of course, I didn't do that over... Well, hey, Instead, it, I wound up working and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't entirely your fault, because you wanted to do this weeks ago, and I was like three quarters of the way through a big story, my mermaid story, and I said, hey, dude, just please let me finish this thing. And then as soon as I'm done, we'll start on that other thing. Because I'm afraid that if I divert attention from the mermaid story, it'll always be three quarters of the way done. You don't have any... Well, maybe you do. But I have so many stories out there that are three quarters done. And they'll <laughs> never be done. And there's nothing worse than a three quarters done story. Seriously, I would rather have a zero percent done story than a three quarters done story. Yeah, because either way, they're not done. Either way, they're not done, but one of them, <laughs> one of had them a you lot spent of work a lot of work. Into. That's kind of the way I generally tend to write, is i got to plan at least a decent amount. And I've found, I think, uh, that my stories are better the more I plan them, um, as opposed to the ones... I, like, I just finished, or relatively recently finished, a story that I didn't plan hardly at all. And I think because of that, it sucks. <laughs> I think it's just terrible. The ending's terrible. The middle is like repetitive. And it's just a bad story. And no one will ever see this story because I hate it. I think it's crap. I may one day show it to Rish just to... To hurt me. Just, yeah. Just if, I, if I've got some kind of, you know, hey, tell me about this bit or this part or something like that. But... Uh, yeah, it's not good. And the, the story that I did the most planning on, I would say, of any story that I've ever written, was the Battle of the Ideas. And I think that turned out pretty well because of it. I think it would have been the same kind of thing as the story that I just finished if I hadn't done all that planning and stuff like that ahead of time. Uh, I think it would have just fizzled... And it would not have been as good as, as it turned out. And I don't know that I, I'm not saying that it's a great, amazing story or anything like that, but I think it's one of my better stories because of the planning that I put into it. I'm not that much of a, I'm a planner, not a pantser, I think mm -hmm. is That's the way they, they guys. go through them. But, and I think you're more that way too, in general, not maybe as, as intense as I'm talking about, but, uh. Well, life has taught me that if I write something not knowing where it's going, that I might find out I don't know where it's going and give up on the story. But if I know where it's going, I can work toward that. I can see that light at the end of the tunnel and say, okay, I've just got to figure out B, C, D, and E before we get to F, which I know what F is. And it, it gives me something to reach for, to work for it. And, and there have been many times when it's just like, okay, F it. I'm going to write F right now. 
because I'm still working on the story and I have that and maybe it will give me some indication of what B, C, D, and E should be. But That's, everybody writes differently. Yeah. Everybody has their own process and their own philosophy of what works and doesn't work. That's just one of mine. Yeah, that's one thing I've never tried that I ought to try sometime is writing, you know, skipping ahead in the story if I'm not especially interested in the part that I'm on. Because, uh, yeah, sometimes I just bog down and quit because the part that I'm on is the dull part or something like that. Or I don't think it's very good or something like that because I don't have the spark ahead of me to uh, to look toward or something like that. Maybe sometime I'll try that. We'll have to see. Well, And, and it may not work for you. I, I One time your buddy Ian told me of this story, and you've told me the same story several times, of a time when he was so tired that he started to see ghosts rising up out of the, the road ahead of him or out of, out of the pavement. And that just that lit a, a little, it flipped a switch inside my head where it's just like, what if, if you went without sleep for long enough, you could see ghosts and you could communicate with ghosts, but the second you fell asleep, they were gone again. And you had to really strain yourself and stay up for 80 hours or something like that before you could see them again. So I wanted to write a story about that. And I knew how it was going to end, but I didn't know how he was going to originally discover this. Although the easy thing is either you're like cramming for finals or something like that, where you're just not able to sleep or he has to cover somebody's shift at work. You know, you're working at a hospital, one of those things where they make you do the, the rounds or whatever. What do they call that? Where you have the, the, sh the shift that goes 40 hours or whatever that every, uh, intern. Yeah. It, what do they call them? Not interns. Every uh, fifth year resident has resident. to do or whatever, whatever it is. First year resident. Something or, like that. Anyhow, resident. just one of those things where, where okay, I got to come up with a scenario for him to see the ghost the first time. And so, because I was a young person at the time, I said, okay, he's going to be in college and it is going to be cramming for finals. And he goes without, and he, of course, you know, he takes stay awake pills or whatever. And 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 then he gets to the point where suddenly he can see these spirits. And uh, and it was going to be uh, what you always refer to as a paranormal romance thing, where he he, he falls in love with this girl who's obviously a ghost. And, and he wants to see her again. And the only way to see her again is to go without sleep. And I, I never wrote any of the story except for one scene. There was one scene that I really, really <clears throat> wanted to get down where he had a friend, like his best friend or his roommate or whatever, who held like an intervention for this guy. And he, he tells him about this study that was done on rats. And I had researched this study and I knew exactly where it was and what year it was or whatever. But they, they took a group of rats and they starved them until they died. And then they took a group of rats and they fed them fine, but they electrified the cage that every time they tried to go to sleep, they would get a shock and they kept them awake until they died. And then they did an autopsy on the rats brains and the rats who had starved to death had perfectly healthy brains, but the rats who had died from lack of sleep had all sorts of lesions and, and, and cysts and, 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 and sores and stuff inside the brain. Like, I mean, the going without sleep was this damaging to, you know, a living organism's brain. And he tells him this, you know, that's what you're doing to yourself, man. You, you know, you, you've got to sleep. And that was the only scene I ever wrote for the whole Thing. So it doesn't always work, and I, I feel bad that I've ta wasted so much of your time telling you about this this failed story that never went anywhere. Although I still sometimes want to go back. Yeah, you've got and that seed of because it still. I know the, be the beginning, and I know that scene toward the end, and I know how it ends. But I never had him meet the girl. I never had him. Because, you know, he, he becomes obsessed with her, and he finds out who she was and how she died. And ultimately, you know, he becomes driven to make sure that she, uh, that her killer is brought to justice and all that. And so, I mean, it, it is kind of a cinematic thing and maybe it's been done a bunch of times. I don't know, but I, I had not told that story before. And I, you know, and that's something that you and I have talked about today is there are a lot of stories that are similar, but your take on it may be totally different than somebody else's take or, or may just speak to somebody in a way that the other takes won't. Yeah, it's like the remix version of the song or the remake of the song that 
sometimes, well, they're basically the exact same song, but other times they're so different to make it, you know, hard to even realize they're the same song and they're, they're so wonderful. Both of them separately and different is, you know, a good thing. Well, like the, the Johnny Cash <laughs> cover of Hurt is the version of Hurt. And even Trent Reznor has said, no, no, it's not my song anymore. It's now Johnny Cash's song. Um, that's the definitive version of the song. And maybe that's not what we're saying, but it's just like <laughs> if a bunch of different people cover, you know, there are certain songs that have been covered to death all along the Watchtower, for example, or whatever. But somebody can have a take on it. And it's like, you know what? I never liked the song before now. Wow, that song is really good. And we're like, yeah, uh, we've thought that way for 40 years. Yeah, yeah, it can definitely be that way. So even though, like, for example, the, the story that I was thinking about writing for our public writing thing was the story idea that I had about a child whose dreams manifest in the real world. Uh, he goes to sleep, and then, yeah, things start appearing in the real world. And these are the things that are just in his mind, but somehow his mind projects them into real life. And yeah, then just the other day, Rish sends me a link to a, an article about a movie that is being made called Somnia, which is about a boy whose dreams manifest in the real world. Should I not have sent that to you? Well... How did that make you feel when you read that? It's not that bad. I am a little bummed because it seemed kind of like an original idea. I, I haven't seen it anywhere. That doesn't mean that it isn't anywhere. I was saying to you before, you know, a hundred years ago, all these ideas that you and I have, well, they were, they're totally original. There wasn't probably anyone who'd ever done a story about that. But in the last century, there's been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of writers, screenwriters, comic book writers, and so forth, writing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of screenplays and books and comic books and video games and so on and so forth to where basically there's nothing out there that hasn't sort of at least been done before you know you may be doing some idea and in the weird thing is sometimes even if it hasn't there's probably somebody else right now in minnesota who is typing away at a story that's basically the same premise as yours but as we've seen, and we've proved this, I, I would say, on our show by giving out, hey, here's the premise of the story. This is what happens. You know, we give them a one sentence premise. A person comes into town to find that everyone there is the same. Go. Yeah, it, we get dozens of different stories that are totally different. And unless you're really paying attention, you wouldn't even realize... It, it, unless we had grouped them all together like we do as broken mirror stories you wouldn't even know you wouldn't even say oh hey that's the same story you know the same premise as the other story they're not even in the same genre or, or you know that it's it's it can just be you know hundreds of different stuff and sometimes you'll hear people say crap like that about movies oh cars was just doc hollywood but with cars it's a totally different movie. It's completely and utterly brand new. Maybe there's a basic premise behind it that's the same, but from there on, it's nothing. There's nothing like it. It's not anywhere, Is you know, it's not like, oh, we just stole this. We just lifted this from whole cloth. So, you know, I think that I probably still will write that story, and I won't worry about it, and I think I will make that my public writing story because it's one that i've been thinking about for a couple of years now and we've already done it by this point by the time that somebody's <laughs> listening to this right and i want to get yeah I, I would hope so we should i mean if we were supposed to start today <laughs> we, we'll uh, at least start maybe this week we didn't start today uh but uh but yeah i mean to get it off my chest one way or another you know what i mean i've had this story just and it's pretty well developed in my head already you know that's kind of the way I work with ideas is I'll get an idea and I'll think oh that's a good idea and then I'll just keep bringing it out every now and then and thinking about it a little bit and then putting it away and then I'll bring it out again and I've had this one for a couple of years and I've thought a lot about it 
and I think I could sit down and in a day put together an outline and you know iron out the characters and then be off um the thing is just actually taking that day and doing it is the the real uh issue that I tend to have but yeah it seems kind of like we have strayed a long ways from our original topic of <laughs> it's like our, our conversations always deteriorate devolve into writing discussions they do <laughs> yeah that's too we bad. were talking about spirits and believers and that kind of stuff and uh that has gone away but hopefully people still enjoyed the conversation uh, they i hope people still got something out of it and if they didn't well I don't know. This, this can't have been the first time that's happened. <laughs> there you go. But I think we're done. Do you think we're done? Or do I you have more done. to say? I think we're done, yeah. I Maybe there will be another experience uh, in that house that uh, we will revisit the subject in the future sometime. Mm, the chronicles of... Murder house. Murder suicide house. That's, yeah, it's, that was a springboard into where this conversation went. And I hope you guys dug it. I hope you felt like, wow, I just listened to some organic thing. Just that's, that's how conversations go. And, and sometimes it's fun to go back and say, okay, this led to this. And this led to, how did we get onto this? Yeah, I always think that when I get outtakes... At the end of our show, and I'm just like, what? The, where did this come from? I can't even place it. I've got I've got a list of outtakes that we have from like really early shows, and I've tried for a long time to figure out what shows they come from because we didn't necessarily assign them to shows at the time. No, I would just cut something out and save it as the subject of. Yeah, that and I cannot figure out where they came from. I just can't do it. So there you go. All right, so uh, we'll say goodbye. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I've been Big Anklevich. And I've sort of been Rich Outfield. Why uh, not? Yeah, get on your way. I guess my goal is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. So there. When we talked on the phone, you said... Or we could talk about, and I can't remember what it was. There was the one, the one that I can remember is talking about you getting egged and then talking about crazy dumb things you did as a child that right away and you in jail, except for something. that I'm a bad person, so I did worse things than you did. You said something, I can't remember what it was, after that though, about, or we could talk about you planting those seven dead babies in some poor innocent woman's garage. You yeah, could do that. Something that was the number time. one national story today. I believe it. Seven dead babies? Are you kidding me? That's like one baby shy of one of those dead baby jokes. Missed it by...